We're into July now, and it's been a trying year as far as gardening goes. Almost a month of nonstop rain, beginning about a third into May, set back our planting by two weeks. Then we had a week of good weather, followed by another three weeks of rain. I have no doubt that some of the more fragile crops that we planted will not have survived the lengthy rains. And even some of the hardier crops, such as the potatoes, will have suffered losses. Some of the eyes will have mildewed in the ground. But all is not lost, for the land is fecan, and where delicate domestic crops may struggle, wild crops do very well. And so this is an excellent time to really delve into the topic of passive gardening. Passive gardening is a term I use to refer to taking advantage some of a garden's many volunteers, which includes domestic crops that have gone feral and wild forageables that prefer to grow in or around gardens. Such crops are hardy and often thrive where delicate domestic crops may not. These wild apples, for example, grow abundantly in this demanding mountaintop climate, whereas most varieties of domestic apples that we have planted have failed. And these wild blueberry shrubs that grow all along the rock wall that divides our garden grounds from the cottage grounds might not yield as prolifically as domestic blueberries, but they require no maintenance, and they last. And here is young goldenrod with tender edible leaves. Its blossoms will make a good hearty tea later in winter. The tiny white flowers in the grass are a dwarf stellaria, a cousin of chickweed that is great on salad. It loves to grow around gardens. And here you can see it surrounding our raspberry canes. And just beside the raspberries are daylilies. They produce abundant flowers, which, when still closed, make a delicious vegetable when steamed. Pineapple weed, which smells and tastes like chamomile, surrounds gardens and is also to be found in yards. And out in the tall weeds that we not only allow but encourage to surround our gardens are wild daisies, plantain, dock with nutritious and abundant seed stalks, the wild mustard known as damsel's rocket, and the beds, which presently look like weedy messes, are a delight of useful horsetail, tart sorrel, yarrow of a hundred uses, and my most favorite of forageable vegetables, lamb's quarter. Don't let the apparent chaos fool you. Everything that you see going on around this garden has a purpose. We will leave a three meter swath all around the gardens uncut to grow as tall and feral as it likes. This becomes a haven of insects, snakes, spiders, wasps, and other wild gardener's allies, which keep in check snails, slugs, aphids, and other pests that would otherwise trouble our gardens. The swath grows any number of edible and medicinal plants, and as they reach the stage where they become useful, we'll harvest them, selectively so as not to disturb the beneficial animals and insects that call this hedge home. Through the garden are a proliferation of weeds. This shockingly cool, wet summer has given them an edge over the smaller, more delicate garden plants, and shading in the wet soil has caused some losses. But utilizing the strategy of passive gardening, that's sustainable because growing thickly among these weeds is lamb's quarter. Tasting of broccoli and spinach combined and just as nutritious, it is my favorite wild vegetable. I'll start by harvesting the lamb's quarter. And as I do, I see Daphne heading out to the Hascap patch with yet more containers for berries. The cool rains, which were so hard on many of our planted crops, has been very beneficial for our Siberian Hascap shrubs. We planted a dozen of them about five years ago, and this year Daphne is getting three to four liters per bush. In normal years, the yield is about half that. So while Daphne is busy getting those Hascaps, I'll start harvesting the lamb's quarter. It's tedious, but they are abundant, and oh, so worth it. And before I do any serious weeding of these beds, I'll be sure to harvest nearly every stalk of it. I don't have to worry about preserving it in the gardens because it also grows in the grasses all around the meadow, and its seeds naturally get spread thickly over the soil of the beds. One of the nice things about lamb's quarter is there is always some edible part that can be harvested from it. When young, the whole plant can be harvested as a pot herb. It can get up to a meter tall, and when it does, just find the part along the stem that is flexible and rubbery and break it off there. It breaks readily, and that part is always good. Later in the year, when it goes to seed, you can harvest the seed stalks from it and mix them into grainy cereals such as Red River cereal and oatmeal. Just behind where I'm harvesting, I see more damsel's rocket, sometimes called Mother of the Evening, a fragrant, delicious plant with distinctly mustard blossoms. While I like this one, I leave the majority of it alone because the swallowtail butterflies are in great need of it. 
and as I go through and harvest the lamb's quarter, I find other bonuses, such as this wild chamomile, the blossoms of which will go into our herbal tea collection. And as I harvest it, nearby I spot another tall stalk of dock seeds. They are green and tender and at the perfect point for usage. The young tender seed samaras are easily stripped from the stalks and go well in oatmeal. More tasty dwarf stellaria that'll go well on salads that we'll have over the next few days. And just beyond it, an undesirable toxic plant called purple vetch. And just beyond them are a nice growth of oxeye daisies. Now that the daisies are in full bloom, the leaves should be in full possession of their pleasant and unusual carrot slash tarragon flavor. Elsewhere in the garden, we find more damsel's rocket. There is so much, more than I see butterflies, so I guess I can harvest a bit without bringing any harm to them. And growing along the edge of the garden is tasty creeping charlie with its unusual peppery minty flavor. And feral cell seeding radishes are scattered widely, seen here among the up and coming snow peas, growing thick with the useful horsetails. Radish is a hardy member of the mustard family and eagerly volunteers. Here we have more wild radishes growing among the tomatoes and wild oats in the foreground. And on the other side of the garden, yarrow is in full bloom. In addition to its well-known medicinal uses, I use it for making medieval-style ales. And off on the south side of the garden, there's a red elderberry shrub. I'm going to let it come to fruition before I take it down. And we'll make fruit leather of the elderberries. When I have harvested all the crops that I have not planted, but which the garden gives me so readily, then it's time to begin the active work of weeding. More delicate plants need my assistance. But with bags and bags of delicious forageables such as lamb's quarter, I don't worry so much about losses in the garden due to rains. And there is plenty of time to reseed those beds with winter hardy crops, such as Swiss chard and fast-growing turnips. An organic gardener works with what the land and the seasons want to grow, adapting along the way and not holding the season's vicissitudes against it. But the clever passive gardener discovers that even when the seasons would appear to turn against him, there is always an abundant harvest to be had.